Well, good evening, everybody. I am just so delighted. Uh, earlier, we started the meeting by introducing all the new hams and upgrades, and there's a zillion of you out there, and this is great. Uh, we just love to have you all. Congratulations. And if you're not familiar with your club, uh, congratulations on being a member of a really, really wonderful organization. Uh, Rach Rara uh, started in 1931. Think of it, 1931. And that wasn't the first club. Before Rara was the Rochester Radio Club. And that uh, started uh, about five years before uh, 31. And it was a collection of people actually when Ra Ra formed, they took several clubs. The South Side Club, the North East Side Club, the West Side Club, and they all combined them into one club in 1931 called Ra Ra. Now, wh why do you suppose they did that? Why do you suppose they combined after all these years of having several clubs all over the uh, the county and the surrounding areas. Well, okay, we had one vote for the Great Depression. <laughs> Maybe there was a little influence there, but that's that's not it. I, I heard it uh, back here amongst the, uh, uh, the QRM. I'm pretty good at copying through all that stuff. And the, the, the reason was there was no need to have a club in the north and a club in the south and a club in the west. Originally we had those because people couldn't talk to each other. They couldn't talk that far. Their ham radio sets wouldn't go from Gates to Brighton. That was DX. Man, if you could work from Gates to Brighton, you had a winning, award-winning station. And by the 30s, eh, that was pretty, uh, pretty easy to do that. So they didn't need all these segmented uh, clubs, and they formed uh, Ra Ra in 1931. It's been a wonderful club all those years. Uh, very dedicated to... Uh, public service and something that has been recognized by the ARRL and other people uh, is the almost from the very and I'm trying to find the exact year but almost from the very inception Ra Ra started the code and theory classes it's been well over 50 years how, how many people here graduated from a, a code and theory class a lot of people <laughs> I mean, right now it's not quite the same as it used to be. I taught the class for 10 years. Fall and spring classes. 20 people per class. 40 people a year for 10 years. We used to turn them out like crazy. Uh, and a lot of them are here tonight. It's, it's, it's uh, wonderful. Uh, so so Rara has been really an excellent uh, club. We turned out... Uh, we found the oldest ham. Congratulations, Dave. Uh, we found the person, I'm sorry, who was licensed the longest. We did not find the oldest ham in the room tonight. I stopped doing that a while back because the answer was always the same. <laughs> I mean, when you got a guy in the back having a good time who's 96 years old, I mean, not much changes. He's always going to be the old timer. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we lost WB2MDO, uh, Chet Albrecht, uh, just, uh, just a while back. You may have seen his uh, obit in the last uh, copy of the reg. So we're going to have a change tonight. So let's, uh, let's start with uh, 80. Who here is 80 years old or more? One, two... Oh, we, you know, I, I, poor Irv, he almost missed it by one year, right? <laughs> so, all right, so we got some, we got some 80-year-olds. Do we dare say 85? Probably not. Go. Oh, my gosh, we have two. <laughs> no, we're going to break a tie here pretty quickly, I think. 86. Oh, <laughs> Alex, 86 years old. 
Stand up and you're it. You're it, man. <laughs> oh, congratulations. We're going to talk a little bit uh, about the, uh, uh, the new Antique Wireless uh, Museum tonight. The AWA, the Antique Wireless Association, uh, started in 1952. It was a group of four hams. They were kind of interested in this old radio stuff back when literally this stuff was just being thrown away. Nobody wanted this old radio stuff anymore. So Bruce, uh, Bruce Kelly, Link Kundle, George Batterson kind of formed this little f informal group, started collecting stuff, and they put it in Bruce Kelly's barn in uh, Spencerport. Uh, so Bruce kept it out there for a while. Uh, and then he moved to uh, Bloomfield, New York, and he found another barn. He wasn't going to buy a house that didn't have a carriage house or a barn to uh, uh, put the collection in. Uh, so they did that for a long time, and finally in 1976, they said, boy, this barn just isn't going to hold this stuff anymore. Uh, so they moved to an old academy building in uh, Bloomfield. Uh, the Academy building was built in 1837, uh, sturdy old building, brick walls, three feet thick, no heat, no air conditioning, no electric. Uh, when we moved in there, there was hay bales on the floor. They used to hold square dances up there. Uh, so that's what we walked into in 1976 when we made the first real uh, museum. Uh, it was on the second and third floor. It wasn't handicapped accessible. The state of New York said, mm -hmm, no, no, no. Uh, you cannot have a chartered museum uh, that isn't handicapped accessible. We're sorry. Call us later. <laughs> so later never came because uh, it was never handicapped accessible. Uh, we did have a provisional charter. It is a New York State Chartered uh, Museum. Uh, so the good news is just, just last week, actually, uh, we had the final inspection by the state at the new museum. And they came in and said, this is very nice. We love what you're doing. Congratulations. Here's your charter. So after all these years, uh, the AWA is now a, a fully New York State Chartered uh, Museum. We're very proud of that. It was, it was hard. Uh, so let's look at, uh, where's my machine here? Let's look a little bit at the, uh, the new museum, uh, which is uh, really just down the road. Uh, after 62 years, uh, we now have a world-class uh, museum on Route 5 and 20 in Bloomfield. We just moved literally a mile down the road to, a, uh, to our new uh, facility. Uh, a vision, mission statement, whatever you want to call it uh, nowadays, to preserve and share the history of the technology used to communicate, entertain, from the first telegram to today's wireless text messaging. So we cover it all, from the very earliest form of electronic communication uh, to the very latest. Everything fits into the uh, collection. There's a new sign out front. Uh, that radio uh, will come into play here a little bit uh, later. And there's the, uh, the front of the, uh, uh, the new museum. Uh, the signage there. And they said that radio would come into play again. Here's the front, the proposed front of the museum. So when we finish building this, uh, when you uh, walk up to the museum and walk in the front door, you're going to be walking through uh, the front of the radio. You're going to be walking through the dial of the radio. And you walk in and there's going to be a vacuum tube six feet high on your uh, left and your right. And, uh, so it's going to be kind of cool. Uh, be very honest with you, we're waiting for money. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah, it's going to be lit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Spartan Bluebird is actually blue glass. And we already have a vendor that's supplying blue plexiglass. This is chrome. It's Art Deco. So, yeah, it's going to be really, uh, really classy looking. Uh, so, we're looking to get everybody. Ham radio operators, certainly. All of the founders were hams, as we'll see a little bit later. Most all of the volunteers are hams, but nonetheless, uh, we want to cater to collectors, enthusiasts, uh, students is really, really high on our list. We get the students in next week. We have a busload of about 60 students from a local school coming in. Uh, so we're, uh, you know, we're really open to uh, to everybody. What you'll see uh, very quickly, because we'll go through it in great detail here, uh, a 25 uh, radio store, Marconi exhibits with real Marconi equipment, uh, authentic titanic wireless room, first self cellular phone, spark transmitter is my favorite. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff to, uh, uh, to see there at the, uh, at the museum. And here's where it is. Uh, oh, it doesn't show up very well. Here's uh, Route 444 in Bloomfield, where it dead ends in the 5 and 20. And then uh, we have a complex of four different buildings. Here's the main uh, uh, museum right here. In the back is the uh, what we call the media center and library. The research library is excellent. Just a wonderful, wonderful uh, resource. The building behind that is the shops and the storage where we work on equipment and what have you. And then across the street is uh, another storage facility and uh, offices. We finally just, we had all of the uh, officers and the director and all of the staff and everybody was kind of squeezed in between the, uh, the shelves in the library. And this building came along. Uh, the owners specifically wanted, look, guys, I would love the AWA to have this. So he, he made an offer that we just couldn't refuse. So we bought that. And that's now the offices, and now the library is uh, free to be a real library again. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the campus. For those of you who had been there before, the old uh, AWA annex that uh, people like so much, Oh, I'm losing my pointer. The old AWA annex that people like so much is about where the S is, <laughs> right there. So uh, uh, the annex is, uh, doesn't belong to us anymore, but we sold the property. Uh, but the building is still there, and we still use it. It was purchased by the town of Bloomfield, and they said, hey, if you ever want to use it, go ahead. So tomorrow is the AWA spring meet. We're using that uh, uh, that building. Okay, moving uh, uh, right along. Uh, this is the uh, the layout of phase one of the museum, and that's pretty uh, pretty important because uh, uh, there's going open in in phases. So you can see the uh, uh, the entrance here. Uh, telegraph display, discovery room, and we'll see all this in great uh, detail here in, in just a minute. We kind of meander around the periphery of the, of the room, and we go by uh, kind of uh, 10, 20, 30 year uh, uh, periods in progress of uh, electronics and uh, electronic communication. So this is where we are right now. This is what's open. And this is phase two, will be the next, uh, the next opening. So what we're going to see here uh, tonight is this portion of the museum that uh, is now open. So as you walk in the, uh, the entrance and look immediately uh, to our right, uh, this is where you'll come in and uh, be greeted. You'll sign in, uh, pay your uh, fee. There's a $7 fee for uh, enjoying the uh, museum. Unless you're a uh, member, uh, then it's free. Children are free. And so that's the uh, that's uh, the first thing you see as you walk in. And the theme here is kind of a, a telegraph. So there's early Western Union, 
uh, equipment and what have you. There's actually three different uh, Western Union uh, displays. Uh, but this is kind of the first one you see. And then uh, what we call the discovery room. And this is uh, based a lot on things we want to uh, do for children, people who are not uh, experienced at all with what, uh, what we do. So it's something that people can come in and they can uh, play with uh, uh, telegraph items. They can send uh, their name in the Morse code. They can see uh, Tesla coils and different things that are sparking and you know you know what kids love they love that kind of stuff uh, listen to a shortwave radio uh, watch a teletype work uh, tune in a uh, 1925 radio so there's just a lot of things that kind of get people uh, uh, warmed up here a little bit more <clears throat> more of the uh, uh, discovery room and more then the next area around the corner is uh, what we call the uh, the Founders Corner. So this is just dedicated to all of the people who made everything work. And this is going right back to, here's Volta and Ampere and Olmsted, all of the people, all of the physicists who discovered uh, uh, these things that we now take for granted uh, and made uh, all the communications possible. So we recognize and, and honor uh, those people. And it's really, if you're a historian at all of uh, old radio stuff, uh, you can just kind of stand here and stare at this wall, and it just, it all comes together. And some of it is kind of uh, kind of humorous in a, a very sly way. Again, you sort of have to be a little bit of a historian. Uh, but here's uh, Edwin Howard Armstrong. Okay. Here is Sarnoff, the president of RCA. Those two people were deadly enemies. They hated each other. And here they are side by side. We thought that was kind of, kind of a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but there's there's other things you can learn by by looking at this. Here's Jenkins, a man named Jenkins, and here's a man named Baird, John Logie Baird. John Logie Baird, in the United Kingdom, invented mechanical television. In the U.S., Jenkins invented mechanical television. And they all, you know how inventors go, uh, they find, come up and they make progress and then they find a problem and they stop and they'll solve the problem and then they'll go forward a little bit more. Well, these two people did that. They had the same problem, they solved the problems the same way and they never knew each other. <laughs> now today, can you imagine this thing here. It's got a bunch of ICs and junk in it. It probably took four or five engineers and some marketing people. It took a ton of people to put that on the market. Back then it was one person. He did it all. Uh, so we really uh, find it fascinating to, uh, to learn how they did all that. We're in the state. Who actually invented radio? Well, Radio was never an invention. It was electromagnetic waves, which allows radio to happen. And that was, are you ready? Whoop, well, we're going to go right there. This is Edwin Howard Armstrong. He was the inventor of uh, regeneration. He was the inventor of the superhead radio. And he was the inventor of FM. So he was a pretty important guy. We, we, we like this guy a lot. He, he really put a lot of uh, uh, interesting uh, theories out there. But more than theory, he's the guy to put it to practical use. This is his assistant, Harry Houck. Harry Houck was not a very good assistant. He didn't follow directions. Thank you very much. Signing sheet. Oh, I thought this was my paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, Harry Houck was not a, a, a very good assistant in that whenever uh, Armstrong said, okay, we're finished with this project now, 
uh, take it apart, keep the good parts, throw the other stuff away, and let's get on with our next project. Well, he didn't do that. He took all this wonderful stuff, the world's first regenerative receiver, the world's first superhead receiver, the world's first FM transmitter, and he put it in a barn in New Jersey, and he kept it for 30 years. And finally, when Armstrong passed away, uh, Hauk said, boy, I gotta do something with this. And he found the AWA, and that's why all this wonderful stuff is in little B Bloomfield, New York. Uh, Edwin Howard Armstrong, his regenerative receiver. Uh, I'm answering your question, Beanie, I really am. The, uh, as we uh, progress uh, in, in time, Huh, boy. Well, it's, it's this room, but it's, uh, the sequence isn't quite right. The, a, a lot of the early inventors, if you will, were really just pure physicists, like Maxwell. Maxwell uh, and Hertz, they, they came up with these theories but they didn't put anything to practical use. It was pure physics. Uh, so thank heavens for that. Uh, so we, we know the name Hertz, for example, because every day you operate on 14 megahertz. You're tuned to WHAM at 1180 kilohertz. So we recognize Hertz in that way. But he didn't invent a radio. You know, he didn't do that. It took other people to uh, put this pure science to work. And the main person who did that in the early days uh, was Guglielmo Marconi. Marconi was the one who took this theory and said, I'm gonna practice with this a little bit and see if I can make it work. And he would first work uh, within sight. He'd transmit something and a guy down in his garden would wave a flag saying, yep, I heard you. Uh, and then it got a little bit further, he got in the orchard. And it got so far that he couldn't see him anymore. And the guy started shooting off a shotgun. If you hear me, fire the shotgun. Boom, so hey, this is, this is working. Uh, so that was uh, Guglielmo Marconi. He took and put this stuff to practical use. So the museum is filled with uh, the artifacts of uh, Hertz and the physicist who, uh, who, who made it work. I'm sorry we don't have this, this one picture I was expecting, uh, but Hertz took a, uh, a spark uh, transmitter behind a little reflector, and he fired this thing off, made a little spark, and then over here, on the other side of the room was this little gap. There was a couple little brass balls on it and a hoop of wire, and we made a spark over here, a spark jumped across the gap over here. And he said, what's that all about? How does that work? Uh, well, it was people figuring out what that was. Sending electromagnetic waves from a source over here and have it appear over here. It was that that made the practical people uh, say, gee, maybe we can put this to use. And what they did uh, was discover uh, wireless telegraphy. And that's the key. We had telegraph, wired telegraph, since 1849. Uh, Baltimore to Washington. I mean, they, had, they, they worked fine uh, with uh, Samuel F.B. Morris. Samuel Finley Breeze Morris. I want to bet one time by knowing the, his full name. Anyway, Samuel Finley Breeze Morris had nothing to do with Morse code. He didn't invent Morse code, uh, but he was the boss. So his name went on the, uh, as we think of Morse code. Yeah, that's what we think of. It was Alfred Vail. Alfred Vail invented Morse code. Okay, enough of that. Uh, so this is a, uh, uh, a setup at the uh, museum that shows uh, one of the first commercial, successfully commercial wireless telegraph setups. It was actually in Buffalo. Uh, here's the transmitter, 
some Leiden jars forming a high voltage capacitor, uh, an arc uh, transmitter built right inside the, the helix here, or the what would be the antenna circuit. Uh, the receiver, they're all uh, some kind of a crystal detector, different, uh, very early uh, scheme. But uh, what made this company uh, successful uh, was a need. And the need was a very specific customer, something called the Great White Way. Remember that? Ocean liners carrying freight up and down the east coast of the Atlantic, never getting it right, because they will go down to South America, pick up some bananas, bring the bananas up to the New York, wherever they could unload them, and they never got it right. They get the ships down here, there weren't any bananas. They get the bananas up here, nobody wanted bananas. We already got bananas. So, so their business was going nuts. So, uh, and this solved that problem. They put wireless communications, wireless telegraphy uh, between their headquarters stations and their plantations in South America. They coordinated all that activity and everybody got rich and happy. Uh, United Rubber Company, same thing. Tire manufacturing was just becoming a really big thing. Never got it right. Get down to Central America, pick up raw rubber material, bring it up. Never got it right. So they too were the first users of wireless telegraphy. Uh, so here's uh, a lot of that early equipment uh, uh, that, that covers that area beautifully. There's the, the, the collection is, I can't say enough about it, the collection is outstanding. Uh, so this is all uh, 19, well, 18, uh, 1799 is the earliest piece of equipment we have. Uh, but most of the uh, wireless stuff uh, starts 1890 to uh, uh, about 1920 is when uh, Stark is pretty mature. This is one of our proudest uh, exhibits or ones we're most proud of, and that's the uh, Titanic. The uh, uh, Titanic, of course, sank in uh, 1912. In 1912, uh, uh, <laughs> people, it was a terrible tragedy. They lost 1,500 people when the uh, Titanic went down. And a lot of people early in the, in the day blamed uh, Marconi. Hey, look. Uh, you put all this fine uh, wireless equipment aboard our ship and it didn't work. Well, it turns out the wireless equipment performed flawlessly. There wasn't anything wrong with that. Uh, the captain, Captain Smith, wanted to break a speed record on the Titanic, first time out. So he was going as fast as that ship would go through icebergs. And he hit one. Bad luck. So when he started sending CQD and SOS, all the other ships that were out there, though their captains weren't dumb, they stopped. And everybody went to bed, including the other wireless operators. So there was nobody to talk to. So that was the problem. So what happened in 1912, 1914, is they completely changed all the laws and rules and regulations regarding communications aboard ship. And you had to have trained operators. You had to have operators on duty 24 hours a day. You had to have uh, new equipment of certain minimum capability. So that event actually started an entire new industry uh, of people uh, inventing radios, manufacturing radios, and to me, uh, one of the most uh, uh, enticing activities was going to ship, going to sea, getting on a ship and going to sea. Teenage boys studying Morse code, learning the code, getting on the ship, 
Boy, I'll tell you, if I was there, I'd be gone. Oh, I would do that in a millisecond. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so anyways, this, uh, this collection is really, really very good. It's the exact equipment that was on the Titanic. Uh, the multiple uh, detector, the Maggie, it's called, the uh, magnetic detector. Uh, these charging panels for the accumulators or batteries, they actually say Marconi right on them. It's all the original stuff. Uh, even, even the desk, you know, Ballard went down and took all the photographs of the Titanic. There was never a photograph of the Titanic radio room. It's incredible. There was never a photograph taken, except the one, there was one double exposure, uh, which doesn't tell very much. So, but when Ballard went down, he got all the dimensions and everything. So that desk was custom built for us. It was just exactly the same size and shape as the uh, Titanic radio room. There's a close-up of it, Marconi code book, uh, the right hat, the right insignia, the right keys. Excellent uh, collection. Uh, right next to that, we uh, get a little more modern as part of the uh, telegraph. And when telegraph started, of course, it was uh, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, very skilled operators. People had to know how to copy the code very well. There was always, always a desire to take that Morse code stuff and automate it. Uh, so that was teletype. So here's uh, some early teletype uh, gear, uh, all working. Uh, believe it or not, Associated Press is still on the air. So when you come in and look at this exhibit, you'll see Associated Press dum, 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 going on in the background with the very latest news. Uh, so that's a fun, a really fun exhibit. Uh, this is a transition area. It uh, shows the transition of entertainment in the home uh, from mechanical uh, phonographs, what have you. Most all of these play uh, quite, quite well, actually. And so this is the transition between uh, home entertainment from phonographs, and we're just about to move into radio. So even though this wireless telegraphy stuff now is starting to work pretty well, uh, nobody has yet. We're into the 1920s, 19, actually 1920, and nobody has yet uh, broadcast uh, music and entertainment to the home. Nobody's even thought about doing that, uh, but we're just about there. Do you have any of the old wax cylinder? Yeah, 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 that's uh, right there. Uh, oh, gee, there's a ham room. <laughs> Like, of course, being a lot of hams there, we, uh, there, there's not a working ham station yet, uh, but we certainly plan on having a, a really, really good one. Uh, so there's a lot of Collins gear. And, well, everything is there. Uh, here's looking in the same room. As you enter on the left, here's our favorite early spark equipment working. If you've never keyed a... Uh, uh, a thousand watt uh, synchronous rotary spark transmitter, come on down, because you'll never get a chance anywhere else. Never. <laughs> uh, but there it is. Uh, lots of sparks. On an antenna? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, we don't hook, a, hook it up to an antenna. <laughs> This, uh, this, this transmitter is pretty interesting. It's a 1,000 watt synchronous rotary gap uh, built by 8TC, which was George Batterson. Remember I said the three founders of AWA? One of them was George Batterson. Uh, George got interested in this wireless stuff in 1912 when he heard the Titanic traffic. And he said, boy, this is kind of interesting. Uh, so he got his uh, uh, license uh, two years later, built this transmitter, and has been in continuous operation ever since uh, at the museum, of course. Uh, amateur radio started in 1912. And if you come to the museum, we'll tell you the story of how this transmitter right here 
1910, 1911, was used by hobbyists. Uh, no ham radio yet. That took 1912 before there was something called amateur radio. Uh, but hobbyists would use uh, things like that to talk a mile or so with a little Ford spark coil. And uh, Unfortunately, everybody was on the same frequency. So all these hobbyists playing around and the commercial boys and more importantly, the ships going up and down if you were on the ocean shore or the lake shore, uh, just interfering with those guys terribly. They hated hams. They hated them and said, we got to get these guys off the air. So the FCC finally said, okay, you win. We're going to take these hams and get rid of them. Well, they didn't physically get, get rid of them, but in 1912, they forced you to get a license. And once you got a license, you had to move way up in frequency, all the way up to the short wave bands, useless frequencies that nobody could ever make any use of. Uh, so the commercial boys are going to stay down at... 100 kilohertz or so, we'll put these hams way up at a megahertz and let them fool around and they're not going to hurt anybody. Well, it didn't take long before the hams were uh, with just a few watts of power, you know, sending signals thousands of miles where the commercial boys were still using 100,000 watts, antennas miles long and just barely getting the same results. So the hams and uh, proved the shortwave is pretty, uh, pretty interesting stuff. So a lot of uh, ham stuff there. Uh, another ex major exhibit is the uh, military. Unfortunately, uh, wartime has always been a catalyst uh, to increase uh, radio wireless skills and uh, equipment. Uh, so this is a, a small part of the uh, big military collection. Tomorrow, if you come to the uh, antique uh, wireless spring meet, uh, you'll see these two pieces here. Very interesting. Uh, this is an ART-13. It's a 100-watt transmitter that was used in just about all of the U.S. bombers. Uh, one of our bombers, several of our bombers got in trouble in World War II. They had to land in Russia. Russia said, hey, come on in. It's okay. We love you. Well, the people could leave, but you gotta, you got to leave your airplanes here. <laughs> so, so a little bit later, uh, we found these. Here's an ART-13 made in U.S. Here's an ART-13 made in Russia. And they're almost identical. There's a little difference in the meters. And that went on again and again and again. Uh, we have some Australian-made HROs and uh, Japanese-made radios that were copied. So there's a lot of interesting uh, military uh, military. Uh. We, we were going to put a the, the tails. The, uh, the the radio suite out of a B-17 bomber. I mean, we were going to get the bomber. <laughs> I mean, they had great plans. So he ended up, it wouldn't fit. <laughs> so, so anyway, but here, but here it is. Great plans nonetheless. Here's all the radio equipment out of the bomber. Uh, the long haul stuff. Uh, BC-348. Uh, this, this is stuff that the plane would use to talk you know, from their bombing Germany, uh, they would talk back to England. But there's also a great need to talk from plane to plane. So these were command sets. So command sets uh, talk to the planes in the formation, and the big sets uh, talk to long haul. These radios, three transmitters, uh, power supply modulator. These things were so popular at the end of the war, you could buy these brand new in a box, never used, $3, $3.50. And so all the hams bought them, of course, and they drilled holes in them and added switches. And so today, when you want a good one, they're not available. And a lot of people want them. All the people restoring the old airplanes and what have you. Now, they don't want to use them. They just want to set them up there and look pretty. 
And you can't find them. <laughs> they all have holes drilled in them. Who did that? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, see, see these uh, boxes here? Flexible cables. Yeah, there's speedometer cables going up to adjust the frequency of the radios. And you could do that from uh, uh, the pilot's uh, position or the radio operator's uh, position. Uh, television, we have a lot in, uh, of television. This one is kind of interesting. It's 1927. 1927 was a wonderful year for television. Uh, this is a 1927 televisor that was made by Gordon Brown. Oh, oh, anybody know that? Gordon Brown was the founder of WSAY Radio. And uh, so he, he built this back when it was kind of a fun thing to do. In 1927, there was regularly scheduled television broad, broadcast two hours a night. Every night, two hours, you could get a broad TV signal. Uh, all you got was a real fuzzy picture, uh, but it was something. And of course, the, it, it didn't matter that the picture was fuzzy. It didn't matter. The fact that you could see anything was major bragging rights. Uh, so a lot of people were playing around with this stuff. It's pretty easy. It's a metal disc with some holes drilled in it and rotating and some uh, detectors. and uh, you, could, you could make it work. Uh, if in 1927, you were standing here looking through this magnifying lens at this fuzzy picture in there. They had a term for you. You were called a looker-in. A, a looker-in. There weren't very many of you. <laughs> but, but, but again, uh, Jen remember Jenkins? Jenkins Laboratory in Washington, D.C. transmitted two hours a night, and they would just send one picture over and over and over and over, and you would sit there. The biggest problem was sync, because your disc had to be precisely the same speed as the disc behind the camera. Otherwise, you'd never get any kind of sync. You'd never get a picture. 1927 uh, is when... This TV came out. If you go to the museum, you'll see a picture on this one uh, from 1927. And I'll cheat a little bit. I'll tell you. It's the spirit of St. Louis, which was 1927. In 1927, using... Uh, we don't have it. Uh, using something almost identical to that was the first transatlantic te uh, television signal. 1927, think of it. And a few years ago, a huge organization in the United Kingdom, uh, a, a television historical group, said we would like to recreate that accomplishment. But they couldn't find anybody in the U.S. who had any equipment, any know-how, anybody to do that. And finally, they contacted the AWA Museum. And we said, sure, we don't know anything about it, but we'll do it. Uh, so, <laughs> so we did. Uh, the transmission in 1927 uh, was on about uh, 6 megahertz. We knew we had to use a hand band, so we messed around. So anyways, we used 15 meters. And the signal was about 3 megacycles wide in the 15 meter phone band. <laughs> there could be no interference. If there was any signal in the pass band of the picture, it would just tear it up. It would not work. So I sat there for hours and hours and the guys in the UK are transmitting and transmitting and we're just getting this garble. And finally the day came where they're gonna do the test. They had newspapers, they had dignitaries, they had everybody at the museum in the UK. Said, okay, go ahead and make the transmission. And they started. Everybody in the 15 meter band stopped talking at the same time. <laughs> I don't know why, but the band went 
quiet. There was nobody there. And the propagation got really, really good. The signal got really, really strong. And all of a sudden, there it was. A picture of Snooky Bill. Snooky Bill was a puppet. And it was very famous in the UK. And that's the, what they used uh, as a picture. Uh, so, so I, it was so good. I almost forgot to take a picture of it. I had my camera there on the tripod and everything, and said, "Oh, geez, I can get her picture." Click. Uh, it's you'll see pictures of that. It got written up all over. <laughs> Anyways, uh, AWA is pretty good for doing stuff like that. Uh, one of the things you'll see is the uh, uh, a little cellular exhibit. This is the world's first cellular telephone, right here. <laughs> Uh, not quite portable, uh, but it was uh, it was the first. 1977 Bell Telephone knew they had a problem. They had a problem because in a city like New York, Chicago, you could only have 16 people making a phone call at one time, a, a mobile telephone call at one time. Six, 16 people. Uh, several reasons. One is. That's the, only, that's the maximum number of channels that the FCC had allocated. Uh, so, right away. So, Bell came up with it, Bell Telephone Company, came up with this idea of using the facilities over and over again, handing off what we would now call cell sites. Huh, pretty good idea. Bell was a telephone company. Uh, so they went around looking for somebody in the radio business to build their radios. They went to everybody. They went to Motorola, GE. They went to Harris Corporation here in Rochester. Everybody said that's the silliest idea we ever heard of. Except for a little company, young entrepreneur engineers, I just love people like that, in Tokyo called Oki Electronics. And of course, today, everybody knows Oki Electronics. Uh, they said, yeah, so there's the Oki uh, transceiver. Here's the Bell telephone, telephone portion. Here's the control head that set up in your uh, front of your car. And they ran that in trials in Chicago uh, for about six months. It was wonderfully successful. And uh, they said, OK, we're done. We're going to go into production. We're going to. We're going to go with this. Uh, and the manager said, well, take all the radios out of the cars, get rid of them. Uh, and the story goes, he got about 10 feet away and turned around and said, but save me serial number one. So they did. They took serial number one, and right there on the name tag, serial number 0001, uh, put that on his desk, and he kept it for how long? You heard the number before. He kept it for 30 years. And he said, boy, I ought to do something with this. And he found the AWA, and uh, that's why it's here in Little Bloomfield, New York. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of stuff like that. And uh, uh, well, there, there's others, other handsets. And over, over here, you'll see some interesting stuff made uh, right here in Rochester at, at Harris. Because once we had cellular, they're going, well, that's OK, but some cities had cellular, some cities had IMTS, so you either had to have two radios. Harris made radios that did both, that IMTS and cellular. Uh, we have some of those. Uh, here's a, a little bigger picture of that area. Oh. Uh, this is a... Uh, a uh, partial view of the 1925 radio store. There's a little better, uh, better view of it. 1925 is a really, really interesting year because uh, we're, we're finally we're into this radio stuff and we're actually using the term radio now. Uh, so broadcasting started uh, in November 1920, KDKA, Pittsburgh. Uh, Pretty funny the way it started. I mean, there were no radio sets in the home, none. Why would you have a radio? Nobody was transmitting. Why would you transmit? Nobody was listening. 
So it was a real, it was a real startup problem. Uh, but the KDKA, the, uh, they decided to uh, give it a shot, and they started uh, uh, broadcasting, and it just went crazy from uh, from then on. So this is five years later. This is 1925. There are five million radio sets in the home, and half of those are homemade. Pretty interesting. Uh, so people come into a store like this on a Monday morning, and it would be Monday morning, because every city of any size had their newspaper, had a radio columnist. And on Sunday, he would write about the new circuit of the week. And on Monday morning, uh, people would be in the store with newspaper in hand, and they'd be going to the counter and say, okay, I need this, I need this tube socket, I need this tube, I need this. And they would go home, and they would build the latest uh, radio. Fathers and sons building radios on the kitchen table. <laughs> okay, I've been doing a lot of talking here. Now it's your turn. Why did you have to build a radio on the kitchen table? I, I, I miss all of that. Somebody back here? Yeah, yeah, that's it. You were building the radio and you'd wire up a connection and then you had to solder it. Where was the soldering iron? The soldering iron was on the stove warming up. So you'd pick up the iron, make the connection, put the iron back on the stove, and go back to work. So yeah, it was uh, had to be in the uh, in the kitchen. Uh, somebody, more more of the somebody mentioned the breadboard too. Oh, the breadboard, yeah. A breadboard was a breadboard was a favorite uh, uh, in the early days base for building your radios. Literally, a board made out of wood that you would work your bread on, cut your bread, and what have you. So yeah, it could be a breadboard was was available. Uh, this is coming into the museum again. Early uh, telegraph set set up. First uh, TV camera in Rochester. Of course, it was WHAM TV Channel 5 uh, when that first uh, came on. The world's first transistor radio, right here in Bloomfield, New York. I'll take just a minute to talk about this because it's kind of interesting the, the end story. Bell Labs invented the transistor. They invented the transistor for the telephone industry. Uh, they got the transistor working well. They replaced all their tubes. Everything's fat and happy. And the, the big boys, the physicists, Shockley, Bardeen, the people who invented the transistor, sat around one day and said, do you think we have another use for the transistor? Can we sell it in a different market? And somebody said, do you think we can make a radio? And they weren't sure. That was a big deal. Audio worked fine, but the transistor would have to work all the way up to one megacycle. And that was a big deal. They weren't sure if the transistor would work at those really high frequencies in the broadcast band. Uh, but they were uh, ultimately successful and they built this radio. And they took that on the lecture circuit and they would show it to anybody who would listen. Uh, finally, uh, the radio industry listened and a company uh, called the Ideal Corporation uh, came out with a Regency TR1 in 1954, and that was the first transistor radio. This, remember, I, I love how things like this come together. Remember Armstrong? He said, oh, Harry, we're all done now. Uh, uh, just take this stuff and throw it away and keep the good stuff, and we'll work on the next uh, project. This radio ended up in the dumpster at Bell Labs. So here comes a new employee, doo -de -doo -de -doo, all happy, and he's walking by the dumpster, and he picks it up, and he says, 
the heck is that? Well, anyways, it was in the dumpster, so he took it home, and he kept it for how long? Yes! <laughs> he kept it for 30 years. And he was retiring from Bell Labs. Had a pretty good career. He was retiring. Brought this back in. Does anybody know what this radio is? And somebody did. They recognized it. And said, yeah, that's the world's first transistor radio. Well, how about that? So he found the AWA, and that's why this radio was in Bloomfield, New York. But that's not the end of the story. The guy that found this, his name was James Troll. James Troll had a pretty good career at Bell. His last job was the cellular telephone trials in Chicago. He's the guy who said, Save me serial number one. The same guy, the same guy had the world's first transistor radio and the world's first cellular radio, and he gave them both to the AWA Museum. I mean, how often does that happen? Uh, every year the uh, museum has a theme uh, for the annual convention. This year the theme was uh, uh, Heathkit, so we had kind of a special uh, display. Uh, this year, 2014, the theme is Halicrafters. So this will, in fact, is being torn down now. And this will all be replaced with uh, Halicrafters, the theme at the convention, all of the contests and what have you. Uh, people will bring their restored Halicrafters equipment and, and show that off. Uh, a few other radios hanging around. Uh, uh, clock radio. <laughs> Big clock radio. <laughs> they, it, 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 it took many, many years before anybody would uh, turn the radio on and off with the clock. It was probably 30 years after this 1929 radio. Uh, AWA is an all-volunteer organization. Uh, volunteer staff has been... Nothing short of amazing. So let's visit some of them very quickly. Uh, a lot of you know Bob, uh, Bob Hobde, N2EVG. He is the uh, deputy director of the AWA. Uh, the director is, uh, uh, lives in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, so he's the, the local uh, guy. Uh, this is Bruce Rollison, W2BDR. He's the curator. He took over for me when I retired uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, he's a past president, vice president, and editor. He's been a, done a lot of things within the museum structure. Uh, Stan Avery, everybody knows Stan. He's uh, the treasurer. Uh, also works in the uh, museum store. Uh, Warren Wiederman, W2ZRW. Warren has not been a very active ham in many years. He retired from Harris RF uh, several years ago, and he's our PC and network guy now. Uh, Lynn Bisha, a lot of people know Lynn. Uh, he's associate uh, curator, the registrar. And there he is with a toothbrush polishing a radio. Good old Lynn, he does everything. Uh, Dr. Hopkins, Bill Hopkins, A2YV. He's a secretary. I love this radio here, the neon lights inside it. Pretty cool. Uh, Ron Roach, W2FUI, the operations manager. What's that? Oh, who recognized Wolfhong? There's a Wolfhong right there. That's not only, that's not just a Wolfhong. That is the engineering prototype of the Wolfhong. <laughs> the, the collection is outrageously good. Ed Gable, wow, curator emeritus. Oh, my goodness. Len Gesson, Lenny, we love Len. He's always good for us. Laugh and very hard working, very hard working guy. <laughs> Dr. Ely, uh, he's our membership data guru. Uh, Roy Wildermuth, a lot of people know Roy, he's the associate curator for uh, military artifacts. Dan Waterstrat, he's in the room tonight. There he is, right there. Dan Waterstrat, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, facilities manager, parts manager. If it's broken, Dan fixes it. And if it's not broken, 
He'll find a way to work on it anyway. <laughs> uh, Sandy McMillan uh, and his wife Caroline uh, help out uh, a lot. He re recently retired from uh, Harris as well. There's life after Harris. It's called the AWA Museum. <laughs> Got that? Come on down. Uh, he coordinates the museum guides. Duncan Brown, a reti Harris retiree. Uh, he's our teletype and telegraph uh, guru. He's just brought in, a, just got a bunch of this stuff for microwave data systems, a new uh, new line for us. Dr. Yapel is a, one of our archivists. If we don't know what title to give somebody, you're an archivist. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Russ and Ray uh, Dreimler, both from uh, uh, Bloomfield area. Ray Roberts, he's back. Uh, Bob Roberts, he's in the back uh, back here. He's doing our eBay sale. We have so many duplicates of things that uh, when, when people donate to the museum, you can donate any way you want to, but typically people donate to the museum and unless it's an outrageously good and rare collection, they'll say you do with it whatever you want to. Uh, so if it's a very nice item, we will accession that into the formal collection of the museum. Once it's accessioned, that's a big deal. You have to take care of that item for the rest of your life. And so we take that pretty seriously. Uh, good items are formally in the collection. Other stuff, like the 100th uh, Heath VTVM, uh, we probably don't need a 101. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> why, there's some now. Uh, so, uh, that's Bob's job. He's starting to uh, put some of this stuff on eBay to uh, uh, just get rid of it. But it's not the collection. We will never sell something out of the collection. Very important. Uh, Phil Hoffman from uh, Penyan. And how did this happen? Uh, Richard Levesque, WG2B, and Joe, WB2G. We're, all, we're always getting that wrong. The first thing that comes to that. Uh, Joe is uh, about ready to leave us. Uh, he's now Victor 31. Really gone by something. Hey, hey, he's, uh, talking to Mike. Oh, hello. Uh, he's uh, Victor 31 Willie Golf or something. Anyways, he's moving to Belize. Uh, he's going to start his own museum, I guess. I don't know. Uh, uh, Mike Kalish, uh, he's doing our television uh, work. Oh. <laughs> uh, Bill is our local uh, uh, circus uh, performer. <laughs> This happened. I don't know why this happened, but you know, this happens. This happens when you have a different. I, I generated the program on uh, PowerPoint 2003, and you had 2010, I think. And this happens once in a while, and I've never been able to figure out why. Anyway, Bill is a good old boy. He's our facilities guy, and he's he's got a good head on his shoulder. <laughs> Museum hours are uh, Tuesday uh, 10 to 3, and this has turned out to be uh, really popular. People love to come in at that, that time uh, on Tuesdays. Uh, Saturdays 2 to 5, and Sundays uh, uh, 2 to 5, closed holiday weekends. $7 for adults, uh, members are free, children and teenagers are free. Again, trying to get that, uh, get that interest. So, come on down for a visit. 6925 Route 5 and 20. People often ask me, Ed, what is your favorite artifact in the museum? And that's really, really hard. But I, I love this one. This is a silver tone precision. This is a Sears Roebuck ham receiver of 1938. Who knew Sears Roebuck had a ham radio catalog in 1938? They had several receivers. This one happens to be pretty good. 
It's about 14 tubes. It's uh, I got BFO and copy CW. It's got electrical band spread. It's a pretty good radio. Sears and Roebuck. Uh, so anyway, I, I just like this old radio. <laughs> That's it. So. <laughs> Uh, tomorrow just happens to be our uh, annual spring meet. It's always the first Saturday in uh, May. Uh, there's uh, flea markets and auctions and a uh, couple presentations. Starts at uh, 8 o'clock tomorrow uh, in Bloomfield right across from the uh, museum. So if you're in the area, come on down. Thanks, everybody. Oh, where is it going to be? It's going to be uh, right across from the museum at 6925 routes 5 and 20. Yep, at the inter near the intersection of route 444. Four, four.